she's going to say it for us, is the Interim Director of Applied Behavior Analysis Program at the University of Washington and a Board Certified Behavior Analyst Doctoral. So she's a BCBAD. She's Dr. Yev. Her research and practice interests include autism spectrum disorders, parent and caregiver coaching, we love that, and mealtime support and intervention, which is why she's here. With the Herring Center's FEAST program, and FEAST stands for, get this, feeding and eat, feeding, eating, and supporting together. Don't we love that? Uh, Dr. Yev has developed a tiered approach to mealtime support for early learning settings. How much do we love that? The FEAST team has been manualizing, researching, and disseminating their approach to this use in early learning settings across the nation. Dr. Yev is passionate about helping family mealtimes feel fun and successful through caregiver coaching and education. She is also a parent herself, three children, one of whom is on the spectrum, which I know from talking to her has really fed uh, the direction that her career has gone and um, that her experiences have led her to her interest in the reform of applied behavior analysis. Yes, I said the reform. I know many of you will be excited to hear that. She is the co-founder and co-organizer of the Coalition for the Reform of Applied Behavior Analysis. It's a group dedicated to the continuous improvement of the application of ABA to improve the quality of life for its consumers. I think we can all be excited about that. So, Dr. Yev, are you there? I am here. All right. Sure. How badly did I slaughter your last name? And say it for us so that you it's not. Say, actually. What, it's what is your last name? Vaverka. Vaverka. Oh, it sounds so much better that way. Uh, <laughs> that sounds exciting. Okay. So good to see you again. The last time I saw you, you were charged with having to drive me all over uh, <laughs> the state of Washington. But I was thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, so I appreciate it was fantastic. It. Me too. <laughs> I appreciate your time. So let's get started with how did you become interested specifically in your work around mealtime? Yeah, so um, I think most people can relate to this that work in the field of autism, but as early as I remember, I would work with families from when I was a behavioral therapist and through my time as a, uh, into becoming a BCBA. I work with families and their primary goals were always around these like routines. And one of them was mealtime. So they'd say, help, you know, help me um, help my child eat healthy foods or eat some more variety or eat something other than crackers. Um, and I remember distinctly like doing trips to um, Burger King on a regular basis to get the same, you know, hamburger, patty, plain, no ketchup with the side of fries and anything that it was different about it wouldn't be eaten. Um, families would often tell me that their healthcare providers weren't concerned about the growth. And so they would like kind of just brush it off as typical. And then families would come to me and say, but then why am I crying over it? Why am I so upset over it? Why can't I feed my child? And I realized that there's um, a lot of pressure around children as a caregiver. Um, so just uh, the influences all around parents and caregivers around feeding are pretty um, strong that we have to, you know, and I feel this as a parent now too, you have to make sure they eat their servings of vegetables and get their protein and have a variety. And it's just one of the most cited concerns um, of families with young children, but um, then especially so in children with autism. So it became something that I was really interested in supporting in the home, so yeah. supporting before it became a problem that was um, clinical and needed to be referred to uh, it, like an intensive, um, intensive feeding clinic, for example. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the different things, that sameness that, you know, kids, I, I know a kiddo that it was the, the Burger King French fries he could only have those, but they had to be a certain temperature. So if mom had, had driven to Burger King and it took her more than 15 minutes to get the French fries to him, then he would not eat them and it was a waste of money because they weren't hot enough. But if she would hand them directly to him, he couldn't eat them then either. I mean, this woman was working overtime just, and she was fearful that her child 
you know, was going to waste away because that's all that he would eat. Uh, so there are all these, and we've got somebody writing in and saying that food textures are a problem, that they won't eat smooth foods. Um, we've got a 10-year-old that they still have to feed them um, that because he will pick up everything with his fingers. Um, what other kinds of challenges? These are some of the very common ones. What other kinds of challenges do you guys see? Just so that everybody can go, okay, I'm not alone in this. You're asking me? Sorry. Yes, I'm asking you. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so specifically in autism, um, it makes sense that we're seeing a lot of these challenges because they coincide with those characteristics with an autism spectrum disorder. So mealtime is, in most cases, a series of social interactions. So if a child is already having some social interaction differences, the whole process can be a little challenging. Um, there's also communication challenges. So we see challenges in communicating their needs and wants around food. So that's really frustrating for children to not be able to say, it's this thing about the food that's aversive. I don't like what, how it feels on my throat, or I don't like the smell or how it looks. Um, so there's communication difficulties. Um, there's this focus on, on detail. So I always remember this little boy I worked with who he had this one oatmeal that he consistently ate. And his mom was so happy because she knew that every morning he would at least eat this oatmeal. And one day she got this new pack out and she put it out and she said, here's your oatmeal. And he just lost it because there was, he kept saying something about a number six was missing. And sure enough, we dug out an old um, container and there was like this little number six somewhere. We don't even know what it means um, on, the, on the package. And it was not there on the new one. And so he refused that oatmeal. So like that kind of need for sameness, need for routine. If I'm not sitting at my exact spot, with the, like you said, the exact temperature of food with the fork that I'm used to eating, um, then I can't eat. Um, and then we see a lot of like sensory aversions or sensory aspects that really matter, um, which makes sense because everything about mealtime is sensory, right? So there's, you know, the temperature, the, the taste, the texture, um, the, the feel of it on your fingers. Um, and that kind of goes along with uh, what you were talking about earlier, Shannon, with eating things that aren't edible. Um, and uh, another common concern that's kind of cited with this, in addition to refusal to eat or be selective about eating or just like your, your typical picky eating, is refusal to take medicine. So most children with mealtime challenges also have their parents also refuse report challenges around medication, which as we all know as parents is really stressful. Yeah, and then they're also bringing up issues um, like um, oral motor issues, like uh, I know parents who say my child can't, you know, won't chew crunchy stuff or won't swallow things that, are, that are, don't have a crunch to them. That, and as somebody is saying, he has uh, issues with moving things around with his tongue. I'm not sure, Christina, whether you mean that he does it excessively or doesn't do it enough, because we have both things that could be happening, right? Um, yeah, then a, a food selectivity, uh, Alyssa says, food selectivity, um, that there's only 10 items that they will eat. And Alyssa, I will tell you, I've heard of kids who will only eat two things. So, uh, you know, you've got concern about the 10 things, but um, it could, you know, it can be, oh, I see Christina. She says he's not moving things around enough with his tongue. Well, I want to go to the next question, Dr. Yev, which is at what point should parents say, okay, this is concerning. This isn't just your typical picky eating. At what point does it become something that you need to seek help and target it? Yeah. Um, first, first of all, can I just check in? I saw somebody commented that my mic is too hot. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we, I think it was a little too loud, but I, uh, Traven, are we good now? I'm looking for a thumbs up over there. It was, for a, for a minute, it was like you were, it, it was going back and forth. Okay, but well, we're Yeah, good. I heard a little bit okay. of an echo. Okay. okay, so I think we're good now, but, uh, but thank you for noting that, and, uh, but yes, I think we've got you at a good level right now. Okay, yeah, so this is this question of at what point should families be concerned is kind of my soapbox issue. And Shannon, you actually just commented on this too. You commented, I don't embrace the grow out of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so while healthcare providers might kind of look at the growth chart as the primary indicator of if this is a concern or not, there's so much more to it. And we really, there's no purpose in waiting um, for those negative health implications. So you should be, it's okay to be concerned if you feel stress, if your child is showing signs of distress around mealtime. If mealtime's not enjoyable as it should be, um, you can do something about it or feel concerned. Um, if your child's missing out of like events and celebrations, I all often talk to families who say birthday parties are a nightmare. They don't want to be near the cake because they can't look at the frosting. And so they can't participate. So if they're missing out of social events, even if they're growing fine, you can be concerned. If you're um, having to prepare multiple meals and you don't want to be, you can be concerned. So the, the point here is, um, caregivers have reported frustration about the dismissal of their concerns about around mealtime and feeding. Uh, and if something's concerning to you, it's valid. Yes. Um, the other, oh, sorry. Yes. No, I just want to say, I totally agree with you. I think so often we, you know, we're told that, oh, the house has to be on fire in order for you to be concerned about it. And that doesn't jive with our gut. Our gut says, I, you know, food is love. And you want, it's a way that you communicate with your child and it's, and it costs money and you put food in front of your child and you want it to be a happy interaction and you want to nourish your child's soul and their body. And when, you know, when we have kids that, kids that are gagging and throwing up or, you know, just refusing, or there's a battle, I think that, you know, one of the many things that I love about you, Dr. Yev, is that you're coming at it from a point of view as a parent yourself and saying this shouldn't be a battle. And that it doesn't have to be, like PICA for sure, you have to at that point be bringing in an expert. But if, if you're just having difficulty because you're having to cook two separate meals for every meal, you can be talking about it and your concerns shouldn't be dismissed by the experts that you're talking to. Uh, so yeah. yay, Dr. Yev. Uh, okay. Um, so, what are some things, let's go into some practical things here about how families can make that meal time more successful? Yeah, so I kind of think about this in two categories. One is just like setting yourself up for success and the other is those support strategies that you can do when interacting with food. So there's just kind of this baseline you want to establish and a couple components that I think about with that are building trust with your child and then just creating an opportunity for repeated positive interactions. So if mealtime is a battle right now, you're not going to jump in and say like, okay, let's try a carrot. You want to first build that trust that mealtime isn't going to be a battle um, and in increase your positive interactions to make mealtime fun before you start introducing new foods. And that's a common mistake is people just start to do this like repeated exposure. Let's, let's try this and then let's try another food. And they don't have that baseline where their child trusts them first. And um, I've struggled with this myself as a parent as well. So as far as building trust, um, we want children to trust that mealtime will be enjoyable. This, is a, this next one's a big one. We want children to trust that they won't be tricked. So I am guilty of this too, where I've tried to, you know, like put things into the favorite muffin, bake in the carrots, bake in the zucchini. Um, I've seen this backfire so many times where children's, you know, one of their few limited foods that they will eat, like the muffin is messed with. And then they don't, they lose that trust. They lose trust that when my parent puts out my favorite muffin, it's going to taste the way I know it's going to taste. Okay. Um, so, don't, so, so in the beginning with the favorite foods, don't mess with it. Because I am, Don't a, mess with the I've had foods. I've had big success with sneaking foods into things, but I, but I have to say that I did it much later along the way and not with the first uh, favorite food. So in the beginning, yes. don't so, mess with the food, and and set this up as a a, a time that they can trust you. Okay. Yes, and all of this, that's a really good clarification. All of this is the beginning. So if you're coming into this and watching this and your meal times are a battle, we're not going to start by being sneaky. We're going to start by taking multiple steps back and building 
that trust, trust that they, that you won't mess with their favorite foods, trust that their favorite foods will be available for them, and then trust that they'll be allowed to listen to their body. So again, this is another thing that comes with the pressure as a caregiver to feed our kids so they grow and so they're um, healthy, whatever that means to us. Um, and so sometimes we say things like, okay, five more bites and then your dessert. But if your child is full and they're, and you're telling them you're dictating you're, you need five more bites to be healthy, that doesn't promote that trust that they will learn how to listen to their body. Again, another tricky one, another one that's like, they might need some encouragement and help along the way to understand those feelings of being full or being hungry. And a lot of us still need help to trying to figure that out. Right. We have a famous um, but, story in my family when I was an aunt before I was a parent and one of my nephews, uh, Brian, and he's never going to see this, so I, and he knows I tell this story all the time. Um, I, I would take care of Brian one afternoon a week uh, when my brother and his wife were working and I picked him up at daycare and I would take him to the store and let him pick out what he wanted to have for dinner. And he picked out a can of the SpaghettiOs that were gargoyle shaped. Nothing would do. He wanted the gargoyle shaped SpaghettiOs. And so I bought them for him. I went home. I prepared it. I fixed it for him and thought he's going to be ecstatic. He ate a couple of bites of it and he was like, no, I, I don't want any more. And I be, you know, I'm like an aunt and I'm the fun aunt. It's gargoyle pasta. You asked for it. And I was like, you have to eat five more bites at least because, and he was like, no, three. And he was like, no, no. And I said, yep, five more bites before you can get down. And he ate five more bites. And then he threw up the whole thing all over the table. And I went, oh, no. maybe I could have listened to the child who was telling me I'm, I'm not able to eat any more of it. it. It was quite, and I had to clean it all up. And it was quite the lesson to me of, okay, you know, because I don't want anybody standing over me telling me, you know, when I'm full, five more bites. So that helped me when I, when I got to parent my own kid, you know, it's like, oh, maybe That's we're done. That's such a great example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, several more comments here. Somebody says, my kid smells everything determined if he's going to put it in his mouth or not. So in this stage, you would let them, correct? You'd be like, let, let yeah, them smell absolutely. it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. So, so in the beginning here, we're, I can hear people going, what? I get to just end the battle. I'm going to give them what it is that they want. How long would this phase last, Dr. Yev? So it's hard to put a time on it. And I know it's frustrating and it's hard to be patient when you're still kind of in these beginning stages. But um, I think a question you can ask yourself is, what does mealtime mean for my, my child right now? And if it means oh shoot i have to like put away my favorite toy and i'm gonna get forced to um eat and then i'm um and then i'm gonna start the bedtime routine and it's just all these demands are gonna come out and my night is over then it might take a lot longer to kind of build this like you want them running over to the meal time when you say it's time you want them excited you want them coming over ready to sit down or wherever you have your meal and that is that behavior is your hint that now you can add some additional demands okay. or start like interacting with foods in, in other ways. But the step one is just mealtime has to equal fun for okay. them. That they are not like the end of their favorite things and the beginning of all the demands and aversive um, foods. And a lot of different ways to do this, like preparing the foods that you already know that they like, but also you know, I'm sure that you guys have come up with so many creative ways to make dinner fun, whether it's the placemat that the food is on or the plate that the food is on, or, you know, I, I would imagine you have the favorite beverage and then also making the sitting around, because sometimes just the sitting at the table is the hard part. So if they want to eat on the floor, you sit and eat on the floor, whatever it is, so that we're establishing that mealtime is a fun thing and we establish that before we add anything more. Am I, have I got it right? You've got it right, yeah. Okay. And it could be simple things, like we play a favorite song, a silly song when we all come to the table, or you're putting away that food that makes them gag, you're putting it behind a barrier for now, so it's not even a thing on the table. Or um, you play a little family game, or you turn down bright lights. Like, it can be really simple things, you don't have to, you know, today at dinner, if you're thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to redo my entire meal time, that's not the case. You okay. add a little fun component or 
Or if you're a family where you're having to feed your child and then eat separately because of your mealtime concerns and challenges, then maybe it's just having them play their favorite game or watch their favorite show at the table instead of in the other room or where, you know, wherever okay. you're eating, having them there with you doing a favorite thing, establishing mealtime as fun, even though mealtime for them at this point doesn't mean eating with the family. So um, now can some be of this, taking away the battle of it is going to make some of you go, no, but we have rules and we have customs and my mother-in-law won't. But I, I think at this point you're saying shove all of that in the nearest coat closet and we'll come back to it later. Right? It, yes. It, yes. It takes patience and it's hard. And I always tell families it's not going to be forever, but if you want to establish, if you if you want to remove that battle and kind of flip the way mealtime feels for you and your child, you have to start by by pairing it with those okay. those fun things first. Okay, Rosemary loves the idea of playing the favorite song right before mealtime, and Joanne has said that um, her ten year old with ASD doesn't know when he's full or hungry. How do we teach that? He will ask for a snack, and I offer something healthy, and he says no, thank you. I, I think that's an indication that he wanted to eat the thing, but he wasn't hungry. Am I wrong? Exactly. Okay. Um, because when they are hungry, I, I had the kid, because of other things, I had the kid that would eat vegetables, and, and we would be in a restaurant, and people would go, ha, I've never seen a baby eat vegetables before. How are you getting that baby to eat vegetables? And I would always say, because he's hungry, and that's what we put in front of him. Um, now, that doesn't work for all kids, right? Because if they have a sensitivity to things or whatever, but he had had that from the time that he was a baby because I was a vegetarian. Um, so vegetables were what we had and was available, and he was hungry. We hadn't let him snack beforehand, so he would eat the vegetables. And I have seen kids eat things that the parent says they will not eat, um, but we took away the sugar snack that they would normally have at 4 o'clock so that when it was dinner time, they were actually hungry. Um, I don't want to take you yeah. off of your, your thing. Um, but, but I think, Joanne, if, if you offer him something that's healthy and he says no, eventually he's going to be hungry enough to want that. Or am I completely wrong, Dr. Yev? <laughs> I mean, it, I, I know this is an annoying answer, but it kind of depends on the kid. In some cases, you're complete, that's completely right. In other cases, that it's kind of a myth that kids eat when, the, when they're hungry. It's like kids eat when they're hungry and the correct circumstance, circumstances surround them. And so like, I think about um, myself too. Like if I, even if I'm hungry, if something's put in front of me that gives me a gag reaction, yeah. I'm not gonna eat. That's or true. if something's put in front of me, or like, like if I pack my lunch and you, you all have probably done this, if you pack your lunch with you, but it's your like leftovers that you've been eating multiple days in a row and you're, hungry and you take it out and you're like, oh, I'll just take a few bites, but I'm not really that excited about it. And then your hunger, like the motivation to eat can change depending on the context around you. A good point. Good point. Okay. So once we get to the point where we, we feel that we've got that baseline of dinner is now no longer a battle, your child trusts you. And that for some people that might take a week and for other people that might take a while, right? Like maybe even two months you know, that it could take to establish that baseline. But once you've established the baseline, what's the next thing on your tier? So there's a few things you can do, but one thing I learned this from um, an occupational therapist years ago, and she called it the parentheses diet. And I love starting here. So you kind of think about, okay, what is something my child will eat? And I'll give you an example, cereal bars. And then you say, well, what goes in the parentheses? So they'll eat cereal bars, but and they have to be Nutri-Grain brand. They have to be whole. They can only be strawberry flavored and they can't be unwrapped for them. And so when there's that many things in the parentheses, you're not going to be able to just say like, let's try introducing bananas. You have to work out those things out of the parentheses first. So a possible first step in that case might be just reinforcing tolerance of it being unwrapped a tiny bit. If it can't be unwrapped for them, then they're not going to tolerate change that's really big in the form of a new food. But you can work on, okay, how can I reinforce? Like, what are some fun things we can do? Um, 
when they are okay with me unwrapping it. And again, this isn't tricking it. We're saying like, okay, we're gonna do this. It might be tricky where this is something new. After we do this, why don't we play our favorite song or let's play a little, that favorite game we have together, or bring the toy to the table. Um, so really reinforcing flexibility with change first, rather than bringing in a new quantity of something would be my, most of the time, my starting point, those baby steps. Okay. Uh, and uh, Christina has said, my son eats a bite and runs and goes to a sensory activity and then comes back. So in the baseline phase, we would say that this is okay, correct? If, if mealtime is enjoyable, that's a good start. Okay. But eventually, if we want to work towards him being able to sit in a chair and eat um, without having to get up and run to a sensory activity and come back, so he's eat, let's say he's eating the applesauce, but the parentheses is that he's only eating it if he can take a bite and then go run and do something sensory. So how do you how would you work on that? Yeah. So the baby steps for that, it could, there's a couple things that come to mind. One is to the kind of the most fun thing to do would be to somehow make the eating a sensory activity, but it depends on kind of what he's seeking. But is there a sensory activity you can bring to the table to increase the amount of time he's there? So then he, you know, takes the bite of applesauce, plays with the sensory activity right next to him. Or can you increase and say like, okay, two, two bites, first two bites, and then let's go together and make it a fun game. Like you're, instead of yeah. saying like, stay at the table, stay at the table, you're joining him in that, but you're increasing kind of the the request um, or how maybe not the two bites, but how much time he's sitting at the table that we again are teaching him to listen to his own body too. Love that. So when people are in the part where they're working on the parentheses, I'm going to guess that they really could use some support for that phase. That, that for the parent, it's a little overwhelming. And so talk to me a little bit about, you've got this wonderful um, feast program. How would somebody either reach out to you or can their, can their um, the people that they're working with get trained in the feast method? Like talk to us a little bit about how that would work. Yeah, absolutely. Through, so um, through the University of Washington's Herring Center, we're working on um, some trainings and are available for those. So um, Shannon, I'm happy for my email to be shared for folks to reach out because um, we can kind of tailor it depending on what the need is. We'll have some um, like self-paced, a self-paced uh, mealtime training online available um, pretty soon here. Um, but yeah, we can, we can certainly work to support um, folks okay. and whatever whatever that means for them. Okay, but they can, but so I would definitely reach out to Dr. Yev, you guys. Do you want to say what your email is for those that are listening in podcast? Sure. Yeah, it's y-e-v-e-v -E -E at u-w dot e-d-u. It's not as hard as we thought it was going to be. We have to... <laughs> Um, and we'll try to put that in the, the notes, the show notes as well. So you can reach out to Dr. Yev and talk about that. And you can also reach out to your, your provider for whatever services that you guys are getting. I think it, feeding comes under a very interesting heading sometimes, Dr. Yev, that um, I have heard of ABA providers certainly that have done feeding training with caregivers, but I have heard of ABA providers who have said, we don't do feeding issues, which is interesting to me. Uh, I have heard, that is interesting. right? Isn't that interesting? I have heard of OTs who have worked on certainly the oral motor kinds of things, as well as SLPs, sometimes in some circumstances. But far more often, the parent goes, I have a team of people and no one does feeding issues. This is kind of what inspired our tiered approach to feeding is that um, it doesn't all have to be like we wait, wait, wait until somebody has a clinical um, diagnosis and they have to be referred for intensive feeding services. We can do things before that proactively. We can make eating fun. And so that's kind of what we call the, t the bottom tier of um, feeding intervention. So it's that like what can we do to embed into home meal times to make it to make them uh, enjoyable. And so it's not. 
I, I don't even refer to myself necessarily as a feeding therapist or feeding specialist, but a BCBA who's interested in making mealtimes more enjoyable. Well, and that is an amazing thing to be interested in doing. Um, and, and we said at the beginning that picky eating is just one of the many concerns, that there's a whole lot of things um, that people have to deal with. What are some simple strategies that pa parents can implement maybe even today, uh, whether it's picky eating or something else? We've been talking about that, but, t but what else do you have in your bag of tricks you can share today? Um, I think this is kind of more picky eating um, related, but I, but one thing that I would hope people would leave here with is to redefine what it means to try it. So, um, Shannon, maybe you can help me pick kind of what a non, non, do you have a non favorite food that just like, you can't even think about without having a, a reaction? Well, I, you know, I love all vegetables except for wax beans. I don't know what the purpose of wax beans is in the world. They squeak when you eat them. They don't, they don't, they're not flavorful. They taste like cardboard. I, I don't want wax beans, I, I, but okay, I, perfect. but I will eat them if forced. If you want something that really makes me gag, then, then we're talking about calamari. Calamari. Okay. Let's go with calamari. Ooh, I love calamari. Oh. Um, so, so this is actually a perfect example. So you come back to Seattle, Shannon, and we go out to a restaurant and you're hungry because we've been walking around and touring and it's been smelling so good because we're at the Pike Market, right? Yes. Um, and everything smells good. Your motivation to eat is high. We sit down and I order my favorite food, calamari, and it comes out and what happens to your hunger? It completely disappears, yeah. right? You're like, wait, no, thank you. My stomach no longer is giving me those cues that I want to um, eat. And if I am like I am sometimes with my kids, even though I know better, I might say, oh, come on, Shannon, this is so good. It's one of my favorites. What's the big deal? Just try it. Just a bite. Does that try it doesn't really make you want to try it. You still are having that, no. that gag reflex. You're still like you're shut down, your motivation. I would go shopping eat. while you it's ate. Done. I would go shopping. Exactly. I would be like, I'm going to go look out the, the booths. You enjoy your meal, Dr. Yev. I'll, I'll catch you when you're done. Which is exactly. the kid who gets so, up and leaves the table, right? Which, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So even though I'm saying it's just calamari, like yeah. when you say that to a child, it's it's just the banana, it's just yogurt, and they're like, I can't even look at it yeah. without feeling something. And like, if everybody watching this thinks about that food, that makes them like have yeah. that visible reaction, like your yeah. your face changes, right? Um, so redefining try it is the the thing to, that I would encourage everyone to do today. So try it can mean just look at it and stay with me, and let's let's order you something else, and you be okay with me eating it first. So that could be an exposure. And this repeated exposure really works. So um, exposure doesn't have to be put it in your mouth, like chew, swallow, eat an entire serving size. It can just mean be tolerant of it today. And then maybe down the road, um, you get used to it being offered and you might touch it, you might smell it, you might dip it into like your favorite sauce of all time and kind of like lick the sauce out of it, get a little bit of taste out of it, but but it's going to be a long time before you're willing, if ever, to actually um, take a bite of it. And so just redefining that and, and kind of following your child's lead to put more of their favorite foods or like, um, you know, combine foods in a way that might be more fun or more enjoyable is, I think, the, the one um, kind of easy thing to start with. And I love that, that all of these things don't require the parents to rearrange their entire lives. Because a lot of times the, the advice that people get, give us, it's like, oh, I have to do everything different, which I feel like as a parent makes me go, oh, so it's all my fault, right? Um, so I love this because this is a kinder, gentler way of dealing with today and saying, you know, we're gonna get there, but we're gonna get there on the slow moving train. And, and we've seen, research shows that that exposure thing does work. I could see where if there was like 32 times that you sat and ate calamari in front of me and then eventually said, you know, do you just wanna smell it? I could see where it might take me two years, but I probably could eat a piece of calamari. Um, I don't wanna push it, but maybe. 
Uh, <laughs> I kind of want to work on this now. Next time you visit, yeah, I, I, I'm total vegan now, so it's not going to happen. But, okay. but, okay. but, you know, let's let's face it. If there was a motivation for me to do it, like I needed that to stay healthy or whatever, or you may, like, you know, if I was on a game show and they offered me fifty thousand dollars, I would be choking the calamari down. I would. Uh, I, w I would be very unhappy about it, but I would. Uh, okay, they're asking a bunch of different questions, but they would like your email address repeated again, please. And Traven, maybe sure, if you can yes, put so. it up, it would be great. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Y-E-V-E-V -E -E at U-W dot E-D-U. And there, Traven's got it up there on the screen for you guys. And we will put it in the show notes as well. Uh, Joanny wants to know, Dr. Yev, do you recommend dipping sauces? I love using dipping sauces. So, I mean, I could talk about mealtime for hours. Um, <laughs> but uh, dipping sauce to like a kid that loves ketchup, it's so... And that they use like the fry as the, just the vessel, it's the utensil to get the ketchup to their mouth. Um, combining ketchup with or whatever their favorite dipping sauce or puree is with the food that you're working on is an awesome way to do it so like let's say you're working on a carrot they dip it into ketchup and sometimes they're weird combinations but they work dip it into ketchup use it just as a spoon but they're getting that texture of the carrot they're getting a little taste of the carrot it's kind of a fun exploration you have to make it fun too um fun exploration and there's no pressure to take a bite of the carrot but you can say whoa, you tried something new. How fun was that to try a carrot as a spoon? Like it can be anything, a pretzel stick and a banana, but any sort of that um, combination. Um, and this is where it gets really specific to your um, child. And I love, I love doing that. Okay, and Rosemary asks, any tips for kiddos that are nonverbal and still working on receptive language in relation to trying new foods? What I'm currently doing is placing her non-preferred food in her mouth and counting to 10, and then she spits it out. I think if that's working and it's not aversive, like if she knows um, that she has that out to spit it out, then that's great. But really, like... The language piece isn't necessary for combining foods in ways. So if you make a list of kind of her um, favorite foods and then foods that um, you might want to work towards, how can you combine those? You don't really need, like you, you have a nonverbal way for her to communicate that she's okay to spit it out. Sometimes we'll use like a no thank you bowl or an, uh, a plate where it is like the discard plate where we allow kids to take food out and say like, nope, not, that's not happening today. Um, so you can do that non-verbally and just kind of demonstrate that that, that is available for that purpose. Um, but really just kind of the, the um, pairing non-preferred with preferred foods. Again, as long as it's there's no signs that it's aversive and that you're losing trust or that um, mealtime is becoming not enjoyable. Right. It can't be traumatizing. Right. And we've seen that. At, 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 we've, all, we've all seen it. Whether we've been a part of it, or, of it or not, we've seen something that's traumatizing at the dinner table where somebody is forced to put something in their mouth and then it turns into something else and it's a whole, you know, it's a whole Jerry Springer show, uh, <laughs> right? Um, and I, yeah. think, I think most people remember a moment where somebody forced them to eat something when they were a kid. We didn't like it. Um, yeah, so just make sure that it's that not something that's traumatizing. Uh, okay, there was something else that I was going to ask you about, and I completely forgot because um, I lost my train of thought there. But we're out of time anyway. But Dr. Yev, this is amazing. Oh, I know what I was, I was going to ask you. It says here that you guys have been manualizing, and I had to look at that three times to go, what does it mean to manualize? So, but I think that means that you've been putting it together in a book form, yes? It, it does, yes. So we're working on, um, this first one is specifically for early childhood settings, and we're a ways out, but our goal is to make this information accessible um, and easy. So. It's a work in progress. We're, we're on our, we're on the way to it. So um, I'll communicate that with you, Shannon, once yes. we're a little closer and have some more information. Wonderful. And by the way, Rosemary loves the idea of the no thank you bowl. Um, I love that too. I have got that from my OT friends. That's a wonderful thing. Well, we thank you. And we're saying hello to everybody at the University of Washington. 
uh, where your students are and how lucky are they to have you as, as a teacher and as the interim director of applied behavior analysis. And sometime you have to come back and talk to us about the work that you're doing for the Coalition for the Reform of Applied Behavior Analysis, because that's oh, I'd love that. a big interest to me. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think I would ever have thought about that in those terms, except that now I'm seeing how, for me, what's crazy is how different everybody is doing everything. And, and while we want people to do things differently because every individual is different, I mean like totally not paying attention to the science different, which makes me itchy and crabby. Uh, which you know, we've had that conversation in the car. Um, we have, yeah. I'd love to talk <laughs> so about it. We'll have to have you back on to talk about that. But please say hello to everybody up there for us. And thank you so much for being here with us today to talk about this important topic. I think everybody really enjoyed it. And expect some emails from Thanks people. Thanks for having me. All right, you take care. I will. Bye-bye. You too.